and for good consideration, I believe I'm on the floor. development is four stories, the first being parking, leasing office, and retail. signage is not included in this request and will be submitted separately when the development name has been chosen. This case was originally heard by HDRC on September 6, 2017. The applicant has since amended the original proposal. Um, amendments include the original vehicle egress on Cherry Street has been removed. Ingress egress is now limited to one location on Lamar Street. Removal of the Cherry Street driveway allowed for a small increase in the number of on site parking spaces. A retail component located on the northeast corner of the property has been shifted to increase frontage along Cherry Street. An outdoor seating area has been added to the retail component located at the southwest corner of the property, and awnings have been added along Cherry Street. Um, I have provided you with revised exhibits that um, were revised since the agenda has been posted. I will also go through them on the screen. Staff recommends approval, um, final approval of the proposal as shown in the revised exhibit packet that has been provided to you. All right. I know that we have a great number of citizens to be heard. Um, there's been a request from a commissioner we do try to focus on what's germane to the issues before this commission. In addition, I would remind you that all comments are limited to three minutes, and any yield of time will be limited to nine minutes total. Thank you. So before I begin, um, when you reach the podium, please state your name and your address into the record. Make sure that you speak clearly into the microphone so that what you're saying does go on record because we are recording. Okay, our first speaker is Virginia S. Nichols. After Virginia, we'll have Kimberly Feathers. Vice Chair, please come on. Now, yes, thank you. Vice Chair Bustamante and Commissioners, I am Virginia S. Nicholas and I've come to speak to you at this meeting about the history of the Hay Street Bridge and the designation of a view shed. I've been participating in the history of San Antonio, Fair County in Texas, the Alamo, San Antonio Conservation Society, Bear County Historical Commission, World Heritage Designation. And I know that you too are interested in all this history. This area has some of the most historic sites in Texas, and this bridge is just one of those sites. The 1881-1910 bridge is a viaduct consisting of two wrought iron spans, one Phoenix Whipple 225 foot span, and one Pratt 130 foot span, and approximately a thousand linear feet of concrete approaches. The city of San Antonio required the Galveston Harrisburg Road. Railroad Company to construct a viaduct over the railroad tracks in Hay Street. Records show that the Whipple Trust dates from 1881 and was reconstructed from a viaduct over the Nueces River west of San Antonio. Other records of the 1910 repair shops show drawings replacing joint lock, bearing seats, and lateral bracing struts. The Whipple span is a rare Phoenix design with wrought iron columns and cast iron joint blocks. 
The Pratt span has Phoenix components, including floor beams. Both spans widened to 25 feet. The bridge was planned for rehabilitation as a bicycle and pedestrian facility using a transportation enhancement grant of $2.9 million from the Texas Department of Transportation. Plans were completed and construction was ongoing for several years as funds were available. The City of San Antonio and the Texas Historical Commission have declared this bridge a historic landmark. After being closed for several years, the bridge was given to the City of San Antonio in 2008. It reopened in 2010. Private funds were also raised. All of our counties and cities' historic sites are important. This is the most historic county in Texas. As to the direction of the surrounding land, that has been undecided at this point. But the hope is that the viewship will be honored as it has been around the missions. is Kimberly Feathers, and then after that we have Lauren Bartholomew. So I apologize, we'll have Colin Jones after that. Um, my name is Kimberly Feathers, and I live at 54 Vinton Drive, just 20 minutes from the Hay Street Bridge. And not to go into the history of what Mrs. Nichols just said, but I wanted to address the fact that last week, on November 29th, the developer, one of the developers said that in this particular area, when he was younger, that it was scary for him to come down to the Hay Street Bridge. My concern is, if it's so scary for you to come down to the Hay Street Bridge when you're young, so why are you investing in the community that you're so scared of? Why are you putting up studio apartments that are $1,000 to $1,200 in a low-income area, in a minority group area, that they won't even be able to afford because it's going to raise up property taxes, which is going to have them move out. And that's the whole gentrification issue that San Antonio is trying to not acknowledge, but it's happening. If you look at Governor Hill, the same gentrification is happening because the same thing has happened in that area. Nobody wants to step in that area because now since it's getting developed because of the pearl, everybody's deciding, oh, we might as well move. Looking at the drawings of what the developers have, most of those drawings are, the, are um, looking at it are particular to a certain base type of people. And those certain base type of people don't live in that area as well. Also, Austin is not uh, Austin is not San Antonio. San Antonio is different with a unique culture and unique and unique perspective on who we are. And to bring in a development that people barely can afford to live there, then why is it there? There's no need for it to be there. There's no need to be investing in a community that you don't even think twice of. So. Did you, Colin, did you yield your time? No. You did not? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Colin Jones, uh, I live in Dignity Hill. Uh, very quickly, all today I've been waiting for this, and my speech was set up to tell you as the commission how much I have sympathy for you for this decision. But just in the past 20 minutes, I want to change that. I want to let you know how much I envy you for being in a position to do something wonderful and great for the city of San Antonio. Having said that, I oppose the project on two very simple points. One is the, the uh, garage, the way it's designed, and secondly, the walkability of Cherry Street. Thank you very much, and again, it is a wonderful opportunity for you. Thank you. Our next session we heard is Monica Savino. She'll receive six minutes. And then after Monica, we'll have Garrett uh, Morgan. My name is Monica Savino. I'm 1120 East Crockett Street, Dignity Hill Architectural Review Committee. We currently do not support staff's recommendations for approval on the project. 
This project, immediately adjacent to the Dignity Hill Historic District and the Historic Hay Street Bridge, presents design challenges that we believe still have not been met. Within the final design package, it doesn't appear that changes were made based on any feedback provided during the November 29th community presentation or any other community communications. ARC has used the downtown guide as a point of reference on this project and has taken the position that the guide prevails. But if the guide isn't applied, reasonable urban architectural design standards and community concerns still must be considered. We've requested that the parking garage structure be relocated or obscured with the active uses per the guide. Even the DRC in the notes noted that the garage structure is a problem. No other recent multifamily or mixed-use project downtown has been allowed to build parking garage frontage on the primary street. Look at the examples that have come through this commission in the past two to five years. They're all inside the complex, on a secondary, or even a tertiary street. However, planning contends that it's okay as long as it's screened. This is chapter three and four taken out of context and ignoring the impact that over 150 feet of 20 foot high garage screening creates on a neighborhood street. A visible parking garage structure even covered in a thin layer of vines that will have to grow 16 feet high in shade merely highlights that there's a garage and parking behind it. It's not pedestrian friendly on Cherry Street, but instead shows the backside of the project to what is a small scale historic neighborhood street. This is not acceptable in Dignity Health. We have an issue with the massing of the street wall, as it appears simply too tall along Cherry Street. The tallest portion of the building is 58 feet high. Cherry Street is only 55 feet, six inches wide. Immediately across the street, we have predominantly single-story houses, one two-story house. That proximity makes these massing relationships even more critical. And our final item, chapter three of the guide encourages active uses along the street facade to enhance the building's relationship to the public realm. There is a small retail front on Cherry and Lamar. It's about 60, 75 feet in length of storefront. But remember, there's still more than 150 feet of garage frontage adjacent to that. However, the retail space, there's another retail space on the southwest corner, and that retail space has a courtyard, landscape paseo, it connects to the apartment lobby, and the future restaurant development is depicted in the package as high active use place, very different from the retail front on Cherry and Lamar. This is the side of the project, the southwest corner is the side of the project that faces the bridge that is accessed from below the bridge and connects to the brewery. This retail space is not integral or easily accessed by way of Cherry, especially if the owner acts on his claim to control the access. Its impact on the building's relationship to the public realm on Cherry and Lamar is absent, and once again, relegates those public ways as back of house. This is, again, not acceptable in dignity help, nor is it in the true intention and purpose and spirit of the downtown guide. As we've made clear on many occasions, the Dignity Hill Neighborhood Association and, our, and those whose comments we've included are very supportive of redevelopment in our neighborhood. But we also know that we want the redevelopment that is respectful and responsive to the adjacent historic district, the historic Hay Street Bridge, and the neighborhood. Remember, the Dignity Hill Neighborhood Association boundaries go all the way to I-35. And we're not just going to cut off this part of the neighborhood and say, it's not ours. It is our neighborhood still. For all these reasons, we were opposed the request for certificate of appropriateness. Again, we appreciate your consideration and the opportunity to comment. Next person to speak is Garrett and Norman, and uh, following Garrett, we'll hear from Nettie Hinn. Hi, uh, my name is Garrett Armando, 
and I'm here as the Secretary of the Bear County Democratic Party. As such, we support the decision of the East Side community to protect and preserve the lot's public space, and we're asking the APRC to please protect and act to protect the um, East Side community. Thank you. Next, the Ontario Committee Pen, and following that, Evelyn Brown. Nettie will receive nine minutes. Good evening, Commissioners, and you have had a very long evening. Um, I, my name is Nettie Patricia Hinton. I live at 509 Burleson Street, the Emil Elmendorf House in Historic Dignity Hill. I am a historic preservationist and I'm a member of the San Antonio Conservation Society. I, I, I want to reiterate the reasons that I am opposed to this project, um, but I will not repeat or reiterate the things that I have said to you in the past, which deal with the historic legacy of the project in my neighborhood, in my um, 58 years of being um, involved with it. But I don't still understand how it is that land $300,000 worth of it that was donated to the city of San Antonio to be the Dawson Park is, is an item that is before you now. Um, I, especially since that land is still under litigation at the Texas Supreme Court level. I don't know how anybody could be considering to be building on it or designing things conceptually to be placed there. The development project on the parkland is totally inappropriate and it denies the immediate community and all of San Antonio citizens and tourists the ability to enjoy, enjoy and appreciate the beauty and understand the legacy of this historic bridge. You know we're getting ready for the tricentennial on New Year's Eve. The very best place in San Antonio to watch those fireworks is on the A Street Bridge. If you don't believe it, go pick up last year's uh, copy of uh, one of our magazines, The Current, because it placed it right there as being just as good as sitting in the square park somewhere. I would hate for my community and people who want to enjoy the fireworks and start off the tricentennial in a wonderful way to not be able to have access to the bridge because there's no parking, I believe, for current folk uh, fencing it off. The proposed um, project with its teeny, weeny, architecturally ugly apartments that are going to sell for $1,000 a month will be priced out of the ability of people in my community to be able to continue to live, even if they were birthed in Big Liberty Hill and are aging out of their parents and their grandparents' homes, they will have to leave the community because they will not be able to afford, even if they want to live in those little shoe boxes. Um, the, the, the project with its expensive privately owned garages mocks my community because that's the face of this project that you will see if you are in my community. Um, that, that is ridiculous. Um, and, and, and I ask you a question. Who is it that sits on the board of directors of Seymour LLC? Who are these political bullies and these thieves who, who want to rob my community of the view of the, the, the bridge itself since we, there was the Hays Bay Bridge Restoration Group got it declared historic. Rob us of the view of the bridge and access to the bridge and the view of the city's view uh, shared beyond. Who is it that wants to rob our community of the ability to celebrate our neighborhood, its legacy, and our railroad history. Please save our community. Don't let this awful architectural ugliness be built. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
next, and following Evelyn, we'll hear from Keith A. Tony, who will receive six minutes. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Evelyn Brown. I live at 527 Burnett Street, which is only one block from this um, development. And I just, you know, I'm going to start from the beginning. I've been there all my life. My family moved here as a child, when I was a child. And we bought the same house that I live in today. And uh, no one, even the city, nobody wanted to be bothered with the Hay Street Bridge. It was a uh, viaduct built to go from one area of town to the other. That was the original intent of it. And uh, I remember driving across it as a child. It was really, very really. And no one wanted to come down here to look at the Hay Street Bridge. And now, all of a sudden, in 2017, well, you just cannot control it anymore. Everybody wants you know, a piece of the bridge action. So uh, the thing that I'm very, very objective to is um, the, the uh, garage. The garage is centered to the point where it cuts off the neighborhood that is, is adjacent to it. And that should not be. And the, the neighbors at the small houses across the street from, the, from this uh, uh, apartment complex, they're looking almost at a blank wall. So you're cutting off the neighborhoods from looking at a view. From the, I think it's the northeast corner, the apartment structure is going to be so tall that it's going to block the view shed that so many residents have seen all their lives. So now here comes the development. And it's not that we don't want development in, this, in, the, in the area. We do. But we want good quality designs that will reflect not only the downtown, but the neighborhood that it's adjacent to. So I ask you that you not approve this and let the people go back to the drawing board and try to figure out something a little bit better. Thank you. The next person to be heard is Keith A. Tony, who will receive six minutes. Following that, we'll hear from H. Douglas Seth. Thank you. Commissioners, good evening. My name is Keith Tony. I'm a former city councilman in District 2. So this is near and dear to my heart. I reside at 110 Fargo Avenue in the Coliseum Oaks neighborhood. I am not anti-development. I am pro-development, especially in District 2. I'm pro-development for the city of San Antonio, but my heart lies with the east side. I'm very parochial, as we all are, not the persons are supposed to be. This is not what we need. We do need development. I supported Eugene Seymour when he built his brewery when I was in office. At no time did he say anything about wanting to build hideous apartments on that green space. It's an area that families enjoy. I don't need to tell you that like other parts of the city, the east side suffers from a crime problem. But there, on that property, that you have the power to either allow this to happen on or not, people, families enjoy. I enjoy. I go there. My friends live there. I visit them. This is not what we need. It really truly isn't. It's ugly, it's hideous, and would not be allowed in King William or anywhere else. And yes, we on the east side also enjoy as Ms. Hinton said, beautiful, beautiful view sheds. It may not be what many people want to think about us, but we too love beautiful views. And we have a nice view from that bridge. And it's a beautiful place to be. This should not be allowed. I implore you, make them go back to the drawing board. Please, we're not saying we're against development. There's a proposed development right in, close to my neighborhood right now. I'm all for it because it's what we want. This is ugly. It's ugly. It's not what we need. It's not what we want. Help the east side help ourselves. Yes, we have problems. We have some real things that we need to deal with. And you know it. You read the papers. You see we need people to live better. We want to enhance their lives. 
Whether I'm in office or not, I still love my neighborhood. They're still my constituents in my heart. I can't stand idly by. That's why I've been here for hours tonight. To implore you, please do the right thing. This will not enhance the community at all. It won't. From whatever aspect you want to look at it, it won't enhance the community at all. Not against development. Let me stress that. Again, I back Eugene when he built his brewery. Not just because I'm a beer drinker, but I thought it was a great thing to do. And it turned out it's pretty positive, too. And so it had some has a positive, has had a pretty positive effect, actually. But this is trickery. So we cannot let trickery triumph over truth. Amen. Don't let it happen. You can stop it. I hope you will. I trust you will. Because we really don't want this. We don't need this. We don't. And just because someone, don't let someone do something because they can. Please. That's the definition of being a bully. You do it because you can, because you are more powerful. Because you're more powerful. Sometimes doing the right thing has to trump doing the wrong thing. We've seen enough wrong trumping lately. Let's not let this be one of those things. I implore you, please, please, I thank you for your time, thank you for your consideration, and uh, uh, I really, I really trust that you'll do the right thing and stop this. Thank you. He will receive uh, six minutes and be his, uh, you'll be his time to come. And then following that will be, I believe that's Dream 7. Amen. Mr. President. I'm Douglas Stedman, retired structural engineer and on the Ridge Restoration Group. I represent the engineering community, both individuals and firms. We love this bridge. As mentioned, it was a Whipple Phoenix Bridge. Whipple, to give you a little more detail, wrote the first textbook on bridge design. Phoenix was the bridge, Phoenix Bridge Company in Pennsylvania that fabricated that truss out of wrought iron, no welding, of course, to wrought iron, though so they fabricated it with pin in connection for the main members. That, however, helped in its move. It was a little bit later, the railroad wanted to cross all of the east side streets. The city required a uh, passage. They required a passage, and the railroad responded. Go ahead, put it up. Right, here is the print. Um, I'm sorry. This is the print of the 1910 move of the bridges. Because they're pinning connection, they could be moved piece by piece to bridge connection. But it's not just a bridge, it's a viaduct. And that's what it's called here, here. It says highway viaduct. We call it the, the Hay Street Bridge, but it's rid of the Hay Street Viaduct. That means that all of this frontage, all of the approaches, and there's about half a mile of approaches, all those were built in 1910 to raise the bridges up over and give the railroad clearance. Raised them up to 22 feet. Give them prayer. 
1910. It's all historical. And I appreciate so much Bill's interest in keeping San Antonio the number one historic city in the country. <clears throat> they, they, uh, it, it wasn't good. long after that, after it was built, that it was used quite successfully, widened, uh, widened to 25 feet, widened uh, from its original bridge, uh, out, uh, I'm sorry, railroad, from its original railroad 16 feet to 25 feet. Of course, in, uh, in 1910, what you're going to get mostly are wagons. And uh, it was very successful until 82. Then it was closed because traffic got too heavy for it. Closed and stayed closed until we, in 1999, started the restoration movement to restore this bridge by up to its original condition. We went to Austin, we texted up, and administered some federal funds. Those federal funds we were fortunate in getting because Jeff Wentworth, Senator, spoke for us. We, there were only five out of a hundred firms that were awarded federal money. The city of San Antonio was given federal funds of 80%. That left 20%. Now during this time, the, the uh, railroad and the city were, the railroad still owned it. The city wanted it so they could restore it. And so they, they were busy back and forth for five years on legal matters. And that finally, the uh, railroad transferred it to the city of San Antonio with specifications as to its use, the use of this viaduct, its use, and the clearances that were involved. And it wasn't long, long after, after that that uh, we saw the need, as, as many uh, mentioned, the need for the uh, adjacent parking. So we went to Budco and got Budco's letter to the restoration group, giving them the 1.6 acres north of the bridge, giving it to the restoration group. And, uh, That's time. Can you have my time? Yeah, that's bonus. Okay, you'll have to stay here. Rosie, you can have Rosie have a little more time. Sir, you just need a little more time, so someone is offering their time to you. So you will have three more minutes. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, back, back to the 80%. That required then 20% from the city. The city had received from the railroad the depreciated viaduct. Uh, or part of it's 20%, but it couldn't make the 20%. Where did they come to for the rest of the money? Like uh, Daddy mentioned, they came to our restoration group. We had accumulated some $200,000 by the uh, Conservation Society, the uh, the Coca-Cola, the Daisy Tours, Eastside organizations, engineering firms, we had accumulated, and uh, the Zachary Foundation. Uh, and so, to give the city their 20%, to make it their 20%, we contributed, by uh, my recollection, is $193,000. Hey, city, where's your appreciation? And later, 
Uh, of course, Budco wanted to get their tax uh, right off, and so we looked uh, forward to uh, some people that could, could take it. We went to Matthews and his head, Parks and Recreation, and uh, he said, no, I can't take it. Talking to me, can't take it, my budget doesn't allow it. I'll tell you what, he told me personally, you deed it to the city, and the city will hold it until you can repair it for parking in a, a little park at the uh, playground. And so, uh, but we went to the city, the city wouldn't take it until it was clean environmentally. $25,000 again administered by our, our bridge restoration group, $25,000 to run the test and to prove that it was environmentally clean. Then the city accepted it. The, the preface to the city's accepting it said that it was an adjunct to the Hayes Street Bridge and that it was for public use. Public use? That's, That's what that city council heard and passed. So it's going down from that to what you heard in, in the trials and tribulations that we have undergone. Thank you, Mr. Stapp. Thank you. Followed by uh, Brian Gordon, who will receive six minutes. And Ms. Stedman has indicated that she intended to have given her time to her husband. I think he's reached his max. He has, but I was just indicating that. I'll take it. 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 I'll
uh, which concludes that there will be an increase of people parking in the neighborhood, just like the problems at the Alamo Dome. Uh, the South Town residents in the surrounding community will have to sacrifice their available on-street parking to the influx of the apartment project. This shows a dis disregard for the impact made to the current residents of this long-standing community. There will be an additional impact of vehicles already on the street and attendance to the Hay Street Bridge that will no longer have the space to park to visit if they travel from other parts of the town. Uh, the parking garage is also not inclusive to the surface level of the neighborhood residents. The parking garage doesn't match any of the surrounding structures in the neighborhood or even near business uh, neighbors. A green living wall is a band-aid fix to this project and it's hiding the uh, this, and it's attempt to hide this eyesore. Uh, if there's any interest in the green wall then uh, I would definitely argue that a park is a lot more interesting than a green wall. Uh, the only way around this feature is to submerge uh, the parking garage so that it is not visible to the neighboring houses. Uh, that would be sinking it below ground level um, because there's so much dispute about the way that the garage interacts with this community. It doesn't serve the community, it's a private parking area, and it doesn't match any of the uh, other um, residential places that are in there. Um, if we look at the context of the apartment units to the bridge, there are many points of obstruction even just in this first phase. Uh, the building set almost equal to the top massing of the bridge would block the breeze that is key benefit to this space. Um, if any of y'all have been up on the bridge, you know that you can't get a breeze like that anywhere else in the town unless you were to climb a fire escape. Um, but uh, really that's a unique situation that is gonna be blocked by a wall. Um, the building set on uh, on a hot day, this is one of the only high spots on the east side to catch the breeze as it shoots through the city, blowing over the tops of all the other buildings. It's pretty obvious as well that the structure would also block a very important view of the full historically street bridge. The corner of Cherry and Lamar Street is one of the only remaining points where the bridge can be viewed from start to end in its entirety. Um, we also know that that vacant parking lot that is used for Alamo Brewery right now also has that view, but the reason that um, the developers have not used this in their case is because the, we do know that their intent eventually will be to build uh, on that property as well and blocking that view. So this is the only view that we have the power to save. Um, and ju just like the efforts of small groups of many people many years ago to protect the San Antonio River, and make it what it is today. This too will be protected and preserved in its full beauty for all generations to be observed. Um, I would also take time to note that OHP and HDRC does not have a full infrastructure to receive complaints by phone or email, response from the community members that have tried to reach out to o OHP and HDRC uh, has been with difficulty. You might have some of the emails sent to you. I'm not sure, did you guys get an email packet? Could you give me an estimate of how many emails you received? I cannot. Okay. Um, you might have some of these emails sent to you and printed out, but you, uh, there is no way for any of the phone calls to get to your desk. Um, this was a common complaint that I heard from uh, some of the residents and myself, whenever I made the phone call, that there's not the infrastructure for this to be communicated to you properly. Um, these ways of communication are vital for the community to respond to these projects. And without proper intake, there can be a loss of public responses. Um, there is a claim about the lack of initial community involvement and concerns being present, presented earlier on this project timeline. But a previous petition about that Lot shows an estimated 3,000 people or voiced opinions uh, four or five years ago to the construction of this lot, and still another 2,000 people in this round of the new uh, development. Previous proposal uh, by to Mayor Ivy Taylor in 2011-2012 towards the protection of the viewshed 
of Hay Street Bridge was ignored by her department, partly to her being in favor of the proposed building project. Uh, that proposal was never even considered. Um, so now we're here today still making the same claims that we did in 2011, 2012. Uh, these attempts at hiding information and dismissing public response again creates these environments of corruption that are uh, far too familiar with our city. In 1998, researchers have found a document that shows and acknowledges by the city of San Antonio over the historic uh, value of the Hay Street Bridge. As a historic department, it is your civic duty to protect these historic places. Uh, please don't ignore this because of our new interest that has developed in the past couple of years. Um, uh, this community has been fighting over 50 years. Stedman has been working on this case for over 50 years. Manny Hitman has been working on this case for 20 years. Uh, this is nothing new, and the fact that we're actually here still today is kind of uh, a little frustrating. Um, if you look at page 21 of the design document, if you want to pull that up, it um, shows the apartment building's last floor uh, top out at about 54 feet. Um, but yeah, but there is an additional space up here that is not um, designated with any um, dimensions. Um, so my question is how much taller is this actual building to the 59 square, uh, feet of this bridge? And even if we're sitting here contemplating that this is one foot, two foot less than this to meet the standard requirements, the fact that we have to sit here and that's time. Measure out all that then. Is that a full nine? Correct, you reach nine minutes. Followed by the Franklin. today from the Conservation Society, and I promise you this is my last. And I too am a volunteer, so I do appreciate your constitution of standing firm in your commitment to our city, serving on this commission. And that's my statement, probably shared by our president, but not from her. My name is Patty Zions, I'm the Vice President of the San Antonio Conservation Society, 107 King William speaking on behalf of our president, Susan Benton. The San Antonio Conservation Society represents over 1,500 citizens who support the conservation of our natural, built, and cultural heritage. We invested $50,000 in the rehabilitation of the Hay Street Bridge, which was completed in 2010, thank you, and has become an icon of the community. The bridge is a public space that must be kept accessible to all. The society has previously advocated for the preservation of sight lines to and from the bridge. The current proposal has a small setback from the bridge, but has left half of the site vacant. A better plan would be to shift the project away from the bridge and orient it to Lamar Street, in effect rotating the plan 90 degrees. This would provide more retail opportunities and more residential units with views of the bridge. We sincerely hope that you take our statement into consideration during your double deliberations of this project. Thank you. Liz Franklin, followed by Alex Bierno. Uh, Is this the news? Liz Franklin, uh, Dignity Hill. 1877. I'm not going to go all the way back to 1877. But I didn't know while I was researching that in 1877, 
At A Street, the first passenger train came into San Antonio. It's really, really, truly more than I want to know. I really, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I love Mr. Stedman, I love Nettie Hinton for all of their historical background, but at the end of the day, I didn't really, I don't know if I cared. But let me tell you what I do care about, all right? Other than putting you guys in a difficult position, because if you haven't talked to your council members, with the exception of Ray Saldana's office and the mayor's office, when I left here, after I got rest and I went back, I would be pretty pissed off that I was a volunteer citizen and on the day of a hearing, I'd have to find out about whether or not there were any EPA, any standards on environmental assessment due on this project. You're voting on final, on final, for more than a hundred and something years to include to this very day, that entire area was heavy industrial, and then all of a sudden one day, you wake up and it's downtown guidelines. And guess what, there's no system in place. Was there an environmental set, uh, assessment done? At least one, probably two. Because when the feds, when city of San Antonio took the money, this is more than I wanna know people, I might need time. When the city of San Antonio took the money from, from the feds, they had to agree to an environmental assessment, okay? It was very site-specific under the footing of the bridge, and remediation was done with that. Nevertheless, it's not allowed to exceed five years. That was in 19, uh, 2007. Every single toxic, carcinogenic subject that EPA can even give an example of has been housed on that area. And now all of a sudden we're getting ready to put residential in and you guys are not being informed? I'd be pissed off, really. I'm pissed off because, first of all, I wasn't against development, I wasn't against the project. Uh, you know, I think if he wants to go and walk right, right to his bar for his frat boys that are coming down from the 504 square feet, I'm cool with all that. I know it's not popular, but I'm cool with all that. But what I'm not cool with is that we don't wait enough. We aren't importantly enough to turn around and make sure there's every stop gap. I spoke to my, I, I didn't speak to her. Can somebody give me time? I'll give you time. Uh, I don't know. Wait, I'll just come over here. And All right, I'm sorry, I never asked for extra time, but I gotta get this out. I, I reached out to Micah on Thursday. Um, you know, I'm not the only person she has to take care of. So it took her a minute to get back with me. But in my quest, I also, also reached out to James McKnight, the attorney because it bothered me about this brownfield exposure. It bothered me. Was the EPA test, was the environmental assessment done at a time when the threshold wasn't there for residential? He wasn't gonna put residential there. That's never was what part of the plan. The, the threshold's different. Now all of a sudden he's gonna, he's gonna stack them deep and cheap, not the cost, at the expense of the community and at the expense of you, because you're the ones that are not being full, given full privy to, is the site safe? What's the next step? So Micah explained to me, oh, it'll either come from planning, zoning, or permitting. No, no, they've already been through zoning. So what does Liz do? Because Liz just really wants to kick this can down the road, because we had five, five bullet shots down the street, right down the street from the Hay Street Bridge, three weeks ago, and we got nothing on that yet. So Liz just wants to get this off her plate. TCI, Texas Capital Improvements, why would I call them? Because they got environmental assessment team. Five years, that's it. What's the process when a project comes through? Oh, we usually, I don't know, Liz. Pat Hernandez, when was the zoning created? When did it go from heavy industrial to downtown? And what were the steps to ensure that that transition maintained the health, welfare, and the safety of the citizens? Oh, we don't know this, but we're gonna get back to you. And I can guarantee you that just the way you see me now, 
When they talked to me, if they had a good answer, they'd have blown it up. So at the end of the day, you know as much as I do. And if you know any more, you're required to share it with us. Now, let's keep it in context of where you guys can really make a difference. To me, a higher, stronger, deeper wall and lots and lots of ground water. We're gonna need it. The place is toxic. We know that, and if we don't know that, we should know it. The entire surrounding blocks around there are still toxic and operational since 1901. Sandborn maps, but of course, why would you look that up? Why would you take that extra step? You don't live there. You're not her. You're not here. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is Alex, I think it's Bernal. Bernal. And following Alex, we'll hear from Dylan Verdi. Well, I'll get How are y'all doing tonight? Uh, I appreciate y'all staying so late. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of community anger uh, about this project, uh, and I think it's justified. So I'm the chair. Can you please uh, state your name for the record first? And sure. I'd love to hear what you said. Sure. It's uh, Alex Burkell. Uh, I'm a tenure resident of San Antonio. I'm also the chair of the Democratic Socialist of America uh, chapter in the city. And I think the anger is justified because the group did block walking in those neighborhoods. We block walked from Burnett uh, to, sorry, to Sherman. The Sherman, and we talked to many residents about the project, and frankly, a lot of them didn't know what was even transpiring. With everything that you're hearing about environmental impacts, with everything that you're hearing about racism as a result of gentrification, these residents deserve to know and a hearing like this is good. I'm glad to see everybody here. But if there are any residents that are bound to be affected by this project, they deserve to know. And so I think that the review commission should not vote on this today until city council can look at it as well. Uh, because those residents, again, they deserve to have input. When we talked to them, they said they hadn't been consulted by government in 10, 20 years. And these are residents sitting inside their homes, unsure that this is even transpiring. Um, secondarily, uh, it's important to remember too that sidewalk length, even though the Design Review Commission shows a six foot length for the sidewalks, the Federal Highway Administration recommends for areas like this that sidewalk length be at least eight feet for commercial centers. And it's pretty clear that this will generate commercial activity. So I think the Federal Highway Administration's guidelines are a little bit better for a space like this, especially for somebody with disabilities who, because of pedestrian traffic, is frequently forced into the street because they can't walk alongside big crowds of people. Uh, people with disabilities forced onto the street is not a safe thing. Um, also, third, I'd like to highlight that if you review the, the planning documents of the two developers um, in question on page 19, you'll find that the word bicycle is misspelled twice. Uh, this just calls into question the thoroughness of uh, their planning documents. Uh, they're spending a lot of money to change the entire economic composition of a neighborhood. I think thoroughness is a fair standard uh, to expect from them. So this just calls into question the thoroughness of their documents. Uh, I echo the concerns of everybody who's here with the questions of environmental uh, concerns, and I also echo the concerns about gentrification uh, and the issue of spill. Right, that this isn't uh, designed in such a way as to accommodate all the traffic that's going to be caused by it, and the first people to feel the, the consequences of that traffic that's are going to be the community residents. So don't pass it today. Thank you, Mr. Our next speaker is Dylan Verdi. followed by Michael.
Hello, uh, my name is Dylan Verdi. Um, I'm a resident of District 1, and I'm also here with the San Antonio chapter the Democratic Socialists of America, and I have concerns regarding the design plans for um, 803 North Cherry and affordability. Um, so only 10% of the total units, which is a measly 14 units, um, are dedicated to the fixed rent income price um, at $1,000 a month. Um, and these units presumably are 500 square foot studio apartments, although we don't know for sure because there's a lack of explicit information that can't um, be referenced in the design document about what these fixed price units actually look like. However, Presuming that they are all studio apartments, which can reasonably and comfortably only support a single person, um, the per capita income of San Antonio is roughly $23,000 to $26,000 a year. Um, and it's suggested that a person spends 30% of their income on rent, which means that the $1,000 a month, which is the lowest um, the lowest rent um, available at these apartments um, is far above what the average person should be able to afford for rent, which is only $575 to $650 a month based on the per capita income of San Antonio residents. Um, and it's a design flaw in the plans for these apartments because the fixed rent price, which is the developer's idea of an inexpensive piece of property, does not match the actual affordability for the um, average San Antonian. And I don't think that the Review Commission should reach a final decision today, especially considering the level of conversation and opposition to the development. This is an issue that needs to be widened to include consideration for City Council and more community input needs to be encouraged. I echo the concerns of others who have brought up their own issues with the project, especially the residents of District 2 who will be most negatively impacted by the development. Thank you.